Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the cabinet meeting of the 11th of November 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my sad duty to inform the council that uh, Freeman of the Borough, former councillor and former mayor Ken Gant uh, passed away this week. Uh, he served this council from 1992 to 96 and from 2000 to 2014 as well as serving the people of Tamworth on the county council for two terms. With this, councillors, ladies and gentlemen, I propose we take a minute's silence. We will stay seat seated for the minute's silence, uh, but we will honour that and give our consideration of thoughts uh, to Ken and to the family that he leaves. Thank you, councillors, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before we start the meeting, uh, people watching uh, may notice that not only are we wearing poppies uh, in, in an act of remembrance, but we are also wearing white ribbons this evening. Uh, and this relates to White Ribbon Day, which is the 19th of November. And this is our representation of our stand against male violence uh, to, towards women in any form that that takes. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now start the agenda proper. Apologies for absence. I'm looking to my left and everybody is present. Uh, item two are the minutes of the previous meeting. Is your wish I sign those as a true record? Are there a proposed or a seconder? Councillor Powell proposed, Councillor Pritchard seconded. All those in favour? That is, that is carried. Thank you very much. Item three on the agenda is declarations of interest. D does anybody have anything to declare? Okay. Uh, in that case, we'll move straight on to uh, agenda item four, which is question time. And we have a question from a member of the public. So I would like to invite Mr. Hugh Loxton to come and present his question to Cabinet. What was the full financial cost to Tamworth Borough Council of hosting the annual fireworks display on Saturday the 6th of November 2021? Okay, thank you Mr Loxton. The total direct cost of the event was £37,153 less income. So that's the, the, the expenditure for the event. I would like to say I consider that money well spent. You'll be aware that last year families missed out on this annual event as we had to can cancel it along with the many other things due to the COVID restrictions. So I'm really pleased to see that 2021 saw the largest crowd we've ever seen at this free community event. It's estimated we had 24,000 people in the castle grounds and estimates suggest there were 10,000 people elsewhere in the town centre watching uh, the fireworks. So per head, the cost was a, a little over a pound. With many firework displays cancelled this year, we expected numbers to be high and reports have been received that people travelled across the region from Leicester, Derby, Nuneaton, Lichfield, Coventry, Warwickshire, Birmingham and even London, um, which, is, which is a phenomenal feat. Many of the spectators arrived earlier in the day uh, by road, rail and bus uh, and they enjoyed shopping uh, at, at our market in the town centre as, as well as Ventura Park. Local pubs and restaurants have reported a very busy day trading beforehand uh, and some after the event in the, in the castle grounds. We also had over 200 visitors uh, to, to the castle on Saturday, which is a significant increase on the average Saturday. Boosting the economy is paramount 
and all our community arts events are held in the town centre and castle grounds including the annual firework display are our contribution to helping the local economy. Tamworth is one of the few places that still has a free firework display and it's one of the largest ones in the Midlands. I'm proud that we're doing this. We've been doing this for over a decade uh, and our contribution I think really is well received. With every event we learn as we go on and we're constantly evaluating uh, ourselves and our event management. We're currently undertaking a full debrief as we do with all events and that will happen in the next couple of weeks. I have seen some negative comments on social media. I don't recognise these as problems. I see larger problems on the motorway network every time the NEC has a large event, every time there's a large football game or there's a large sporting event. Let's not even start to discuss V-Fest and Glastonbury and, uh, and the mess that leaves the M6 and the A5 in. Or in case of Glastonbury, the, M the M5 too. I would like to congratulate the organisers and staff uh, who were involved in pulling off this event. My sympathy is also with them. Within minutes of the end of the firework display, they were taking their phones out of their pockets and seeing negative comments on social media. It's like a slap in the face. A minority of people eager to pick out the negatives and drag people down. These guys and girls worked really, really hard to put on what was a successful event for tens of thousands of people to enjoy. As far as I'm concerned, this is a huge event and we will continue to invest in our outdoor events. We will continue to invest in them because they have wider benefits to the economy and the community. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary, Mr. Loxton? I do have a supplementary. Um, and if you'll bear with me, it's at the end of what I'm going to say. So we know the financial pressures facing the council with a £7 million shortfall over the next five years. We've been told about that. The £37,000, I think you said, that's not going to make a difference to that budget. It's not going to be the breaking point of that budget one way or the other. It's not a massive amount to spend. But if you look at it over a 15-minute display, it's about over £2,000 per minute, and there's probably not much Tamworth Borough Council spend at £2,000 per minute. The outdoor events programme is good. It's... It's fantastic. The council should be applauded for keeping the events going, especially in the current financial climate. And as you said, what we've put up with COVID. It, I mean, the outdoor events is what I've singled out regularly as one of the top things the council does. However, with regards to fireworks, there are a vast range of opinions. There will be opinions on whether the financial outlay is worth it. I agree with you. I think it is. But there is also opinions on what type of displays wanted. We've heard Councillor Brinley mention drone displays. We've had the option of silent fireworks. So there are options around the type of display. On top of the financial spend, there is obviously also the safety aspect. The actual firework display itself, no one can argue with that. It's a fantastic display year after year. But there was safety issues around that display with the way cars were parked. And I know that's not your fault. But it seemed to me nothing was being done about it. Only four tickets were issued that night. Four tickets. When pavements were blocked, people pushing wheelchairs were having to go in the road. You couldn't get across Tame Drive without going onto a 40 mile an hour road. Now, you talk about the motorway. People tend not to walk up the motorway, to be fair. People want to engage on this topic. I've asked four questions on social media about the display and have had nearly 100 responses to those questions. People want to give their views, and they're not all negative. There's a fireworks working group on the council. It's been on the council for some time now. All I would ask is that you engage with the public on this to see what they want, to see what type of display they want. I'm sure the vast majority of people want it to go ahead and to carry on going ahead. But I just ask you to let the public get involved with the type of display, especially with environmental issues and things like that, just so we get it right for everybody around the, the financial cost as well as the type of display and the safety around it. Little things perhaps that could be done, that you could have parking notices up like you have for Food Gusto directing people. You could perhaps use Litchfield Road Industrial Estate direct people down there. So just my question basically is will you please engage directly with the public 
on what they want. Thank you. Response to, to your direct question, will we engage with the public? Uh, absolutely. However, there are limits to what we can deliver. We, we, we purchase a display from a professional company. You know, we, we haven't got our own guys popping down as they're and buying, you know, a couple of boxes of this, that and the other. Um, so, so it's also what's available uh, in, in the market. Uh, I've got no issue with engaging with the public in terms of their desires. Uh, I've got no issue in listening to public feelings. In terms of the safety issues that you referred to earlier, um, councils cannot control people's behaviour. I left my house in my car two hours before the display. I drove my car for about three and a half minutes and went, I ain't getting to town in this. I turned my car around, went back home, parked outside my house and walked into town. People that struggled to park or struggled to get into town created their own issue and in doing so they impacted on other people. I would suggest with a few exceptions everybody had the opportunity to leave earlier. Everybody had the opportunity to use a different mode of transport and in doing so they help each other out. Those that leave late or rush and try and find a space uh, at, at immediately before a firework display are, are creating the problem. And the bottom line is, we're upwards of 30,000 people in the town centre. There's only 1,000 car parking spaces. And we are not going to invest in car parking spaces for the sake of a three-hour event. It's, it's just, just not going to happen. So I would implore anybody who has the ability to use a different mode of transport to do so. That said, I appreciate not everybody can make the 40-minute walk that I did. But if those that can do, those that can't, have got a better chance of being able to get to where they need to get to. So this is about everybody looking at themselves and their own behaviour and how that impacts on other people. I do want to pick up the point on the £37,000 uh, and the suggestion that's £2,000 uh, per minute. This is the cost of the whole event and there were other things going on in the castle grounds and other entertainment. There was the fair, there was uh, uh, other elements. The fireworks themselves were not £37,000. So this was a four hour, three, three four hour event. Uh, so I'd argue it wasn't about just the, uh, as you suggested, £2,000 uh, per minute for, for a, a firework display. In terms of pressures, I think you hit the nail on the head. This isn't going to fix the, the £7 million gap in the budget. This is about our contribution. What would fix the £7 million gap in our budget is if this, this council didn't have to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds every year picking up litter which has come dirty, disrespectful individuals continuously dropping on our streets. That would make a massive saving to the borough council. Um, in terms of should we do a firework display, I, I hear what you're saying about the public would, su would support it. Should we do other outdoor events? It's all about we can do these because we want to invest in our economy and our communities. This is why we have these outdoor events. It's not, it's not to feel good because they're, they're, they're a lot of work and a, and a headache. This is about investing in our, in our communities uh, and we will continue to do that. But in terms of your, your substantive supplementary question, uh, happy, to, happy to listen to, to different people's opinions. Uh, the working group you referred to uh, is within a scrutiny committee. Uh, which I have no influence or involvement in, uh, but I will pass the message on to those those people on that committee uh, that that you've raised these points this evening. Okay, thank you. Okay, item five on the agenda. Matters referred to the cabinet in accordance with overview and scrutiny procedure rules. I don't believe there are any, but I would like to welcome Councillor Goodall, the scrutiny chair who's sitting in the audience this evening. Item six on the agenda. Investment in the town hall ICT infrastructure and equipment. This is my report. Uh, so I'll very briefly uh, do an intro. As part of the reset and renewal plan, 
that the borough council has put sorry program that the borough council has put together uh, the, the the council has made the decision that we want to decommission Marmion House now what that means is we've got to find a series of solutions for what Marmion House currently houses one of the things that Marmion House currently houses is our committee room and meeting room suite uh, so we, we need to look at options the preferred option at the moment uh, and, and the political drive is to reuse Tamworth's town hall the reason for this is it's there it's old we've got to look after it and the best way to look after an old building is to use it so so that's the simple bit the difficult bit is how do we how do we get the town hall into a into a position where we're able to use it adequately to meet the challenges of of meetings uh, in, in 2021 and beyond so what the report gives us this evening uh, councillors is an update on the position so far and the work that has gone in uh, to 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 in investing in and improving the town hall so it's in a state that is fit for purpose I'm not going to go through the report I'm going to take it as read uh, but the recommendations are on page one of the report uh, and ask that cabinet endorse the findings of the report and progress uh, and progress the date in relation to the work already delivered that we continue to commit to live streaming of full council meetings that we continue to ensure all committee meetings are recorded and published in order to maximize transparency of decision making and electoral accountability that we support the policy change to increase the current establishment within democratic services to facilitate this uh, a request that appointments and staffing committee consider the staffing resource implications associated with the report and receive a further report with the final costs for the ict investment uh, so, so they're the recommendations i would suggest that recommendations two and three relate to a previous decision that this cabinet has made uh, in endorsing a recommendation from the corporate scrutiny committee a couple of years ago uh, which at the time was uh, uh, was lucky to have a very good chairman um, I'm not going to go through the report I'm going to take it as read uh, but there is quite a bit of perspective information in there and there's uh, quite a bit of uh, detail around the challenges I don't know if any officers want to come in before I open up to cabinet yes thank you chair I'd just like to say um, Gareth will uh, do a summary, if you like, of the um, IT solutions that he's looking at, just to make um, Cabinet as aware. But in terms of ongoing support and in terms of the democratic function, um, we have incurred additional costs f since the COVID restrictions have been in place to cover staffing uh, levels, as well as IT overtime payments um, you can see there's two officers tonight that might not always have been here so uh, we do need their um, additional resource making permanent because we can't continue in this way and once staff have been doing um, jobs temporarily the law requires that that's made permanent anyway and that's a good employer and that's what we are um, so I would like you to support that proposal around the democratic function and if that's okay with you Chair, I'll hand over to Gareth just to summarise some of the issues. Thank you. Yes, Gareth. Thanks Chair. Um, <coughs> yeah, so um, we've done a lot of research on this uh, over the past few months um, and basically come up with a number of options that we're considering. Um, talked to a few suppliers, um, some of which um, have come back with uh, sort of indicative costs um, so I'll just quickly run through the options that we've considered today. Um, so the first one was Public Eye, which uh, is probably a leader in the market, uh, used by Staffs County and some of the other councils around the area. Um, yeah, it's, 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 an, it's an expensive solution, but it, but it does uh, fits all our, our requirements. So, um, so we, looked at, we looked at that. Uh, the other solution we looked at was from Auditel. Uh, Auditel uh, already supply us with uh, microphones, so um, it made sense to consider what they had to offer. They're a very similar solution to Public Eye. Um, met all our requirements. Uh, again, we're just waiting for a sort of an indicative pr proposal from them um, to see whether that's uh, that's going to meet our needs. And then um, we sort of looked at doing something ourselves, like we're doing at the moment, uh, using the technology that we're using now, just um, maybe making it a bit more robust and using our in-house skills to uh, to do the uh, to run the meetings. I think in hindsight, um, after discussions with uh, some of the tech guys at the assembly rooms, <coughs> it's not going to be a viable option going forward. Um, 
it just is too resource intensive um, and and not reliable enough for us really. So we've discounted that option now. And then then lastly, uh, we looked at uh, the option of using a Teams room. So these are rooms which are set up automatically to to work with Microsoft Teams. Um, you wouldn't have to bring laptops uh, and that sort of thing. They just they just work automatically uh, when when members turn up to uh, join the meeting. Um, so we're we're discussing that with now with um, a local supplier um, just to sort of um, understand what the requirements might be. Um, <coughs> there's still a challenge of how that might be streamed, so we've still got some work to do there. Um, but I think so far the journey's been been useful to understand, you know, what technologies out there, what our options are. We've obviously got procurement processes still to go through, but um, I think uh, yeah, as I say, the the exercise today has been useful. Thanks very much. Um, just in terms of the the, the Teams rooms uh, uh, as, as an option, um, I, I, I use one of these at uh, at Staffordshire County Council. Uh, and I also link in with meetings with the leader of uh, Newcastle Borough, uh, Simon Tag, and, and they have one up there. And actually, they work really well. They're th they're great for, for for hybrid meetings. And I appreciate we can't have decision making meetings in, in, in hybrid, but they they work really well. And it's it's a it's a better solution than than you'd imagine until you've used it. You know. Uh, questions or comments from cabinet members? Councillor Farrell. Thank you, Chair. I, I fully support this for a couple of reasons. I think democracy should be open, and I think it's uh, it's much easier now, post-pandemic, to uh, engage in democracy with uh, many meetings streamed online and not having the necessity to go along to a council chamber and watch a meeting. But I think it's also really important um, for another couple of reasons. As, as we've heard, the assembly rooms, it's a theatre, uh, and it should be there to be used as a theatre or a conference suite, not to hold our council meetings. I think that if we've got a historic town hall we should use it like you say uh, use it or lose it so fully support it and um, hope they go through nice and quickly thank you councillor farrell any other further there any other comments councillor cook thank you mr chairman uh, i've got a quick governance question for the deputy chief executive if that's okay uh, obviously we've got in fact somebody just clarify this i've just spotted it now um, recommendation four support the policy changes to increase current establishment within democratic services and you go to five request appointments and staffing committee consider staffing resource well if appointments and staffing say no does that then nullify number four yeah um, as you're aware councillor um, cabinet have to give us mo the money in the first instance or full council give us the money in the fir first instance and but that does not put any changes on the establishment so then hopefully um, staffing an appointment would consider that policy change and that that change because normally if it's gone through cabinet that discussions being had and the argument and the proposal so it's not very often that staffing and appointments would overturn or not support a policy change but a proposal obviously but what they would do sometimes is ask us to look at it in a different way or redesign the job in a different way and challenge um, more which is why I just put that in it in that way but hopefully that's okay Councillor Cook uh, yeah, just, sorry, just a governance question as well. I was reading the recommendations again, popping to my head, but yeah, perfectly complete answer. I uh, just want to echo Councillor Farrell's points. I uh, completely support this. It is the right thing to do in the 21st century. Uh, I know as a council we've been judged in some elements uh, of residents in Tamworth uh, that you know our live streaming wasn't to the quality they would have liked. This takes us absolutely in the right direction. We were learning on the hop during a pandemic where you know people in this country were dying. And judging this council for doing its best with the resources it had to get out there and some of our guys in IT and demo services worked really hard to ensure we could meet the legislation and get what we could out there with the technology we had at the time part of that now great job from the guys this takes us forward into the future and I utterly echo councillor Farrell's thoughts in the 21st century this is access to democracy and I completely support it Mr Chairman thank you councillor Cook and if I can add uh, my thanks to the staff that, that you've articulated there uh, because this was over and above their, their normal roles. Uh, we're, we're not a large establishment. We don't have staff just doing one or two jobs. You know, if, if you look at the ICT help desk, they're not just manning a help desk, they're also doing other ICT work. And then coming and spending two hours with us uh, in an evening to, to really you know, leave, leave the end of the day on a high. Uh, 
so so no the the, the, the commitment uh, the commitment they've shown I think uh, should should be noted and, and I'd like to add my thanks to, to the comments that you made there, Councillor Cook. Any further questions or comments from Cabinet? Okay, I'll move those recommendations. Do I have a seconder? I think Councillor Farrell was first. Uh, all those in favour? That is carried, thank you very much. Uh, and that brings us on to item seven, which is the replacement backup system, uh, portfolio holder for finance customer services. Councillor Bailey. Thank you. The purpose of this report is to request the release of 15,000 from the capital contingency to part fund the release, uh, replacement of our current backup system. The current system is running on end of life in infrastructure, nearing its capacity and support life cycle. This has actually lasted beyond its expected life, so has been low cost for some time. The current system is also unable to back up cloud-based data. A replacement system is an, is an inset. Oh, wow, speak. It's an essential enabler to our ICT strategy, allowing us to progress our cloud adoption and will provide us with a reliable backup system, essential for business continuity and the increasing cyber threat. The process being carried out is a market-wide appraisal of backup systems narrowed down to two systems, a thorough evaluation carried out on the two systems and ARC serve chosen based on value for money, best fit for our requirements and our strategy as we already use it in the IT team. It will be funded by 15k, 15,000 from the capital contingency, obviously subject to approval, 20,000 from the previous mobile phone capital scheme and 16,000 from existing ICT capital budgets and year two and three revenue costs to be funded by the existing ICT budgets. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Are there any questions from Cabinet members on this? No. Okay, it looks like uh, it's about time we moved with the times uh, and went on to cloud. So have you moved that recommendation? Yeah, moved. Okay, moved. That's seconded by Councillor Pritchard. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. Oh, look, that's better. <laughs> uh, first, like, first, I'd like to thank Joe Sands for preparing the report. Thank you very much. Um, it is important that the Council has a clear policy that incorporates government guidance in order to avoid complaints and legal challenges to its enforcement actions. So the purpose of this report is to seek approval for a revised and updated corporate enforcement policy. In summary, the Legislative and Regulatory Reform Act of 2006 requires authorities to have regard for the principles set out in Section uh, 21 of the above Act when exercising a spe uh, spe specified regulatory function. This policy sets out standards that authorised officers follow and will be applied across the Council when acting in its role as a regulator and enforcement agency. Using the Institute platform, the policy will be circulated to all services who undertake regulatory or, enforce or other enforcement actions to ensure all departments can refer to it when determining local policy and procedures. These areas include revenues and benefits, environmental health regulation, environmental crime, neighbourhoods, partnerships, car park enforcement, planning and private sector housing. In addition, the policy outlines consideration of working with the Community Safety Partnership and all other external partners that the Council may be required to consider enforcement actions as part of the problem-solving approach. The appropriate use of the full range of enforcement powers, including prosecution, is important both to secure compliance with the law and to ensure that those who have duties under it may be held to account for failures to safeguarding uh, health, safety and welfare for br or breaching regulations enforced by the Council. This policy has been set out in accordance with a regulator's compliance code and a statutory code of practice for regulators. This means that the Council will be open, helpful, fair and careful to ensure that any action required by the Council is proportionate to the risks. This approach is intended to provide better information to businesses the community and by doing so lend support to the Council's efforts to deliver quality services. The updated corporate enforcement policy outlines the corporate approach across all Council services when considering enforcement action 
and the overarching strategy that applies to all of the council services with enforcement duties. It is guidance. It is the guidance upon which individual services and more specific legislatively guidance and regular regulation manage and de develop their own more detailed service enforcement procedures and practices. The policy has been reviewed to ensure that it follows the Council's delegated decision making process. So Mr Chairman, I move the following recommendations. Firstly, the revised corporate enforcement policy attached as Appendix 1 is approved. Secondly, the assistant director part the assistant director partnerships in conjunction with the appropriate heads of service be authorised to make minor editorial changes to the policy as required that do not materially change the scope or meaning of the policy and thirdly a full review of the policy to be undertaken every three years with an update to the audit and governance committee thank you mr chairman thank you councillor Doyle. do we have any questions or comments from cabinet members okay councillor cook uh, thank you mr chairman uh, reading through this report uh, a few nights ago and it's a real page turner <laughs> Um, I was reminded of a conversation I had with a Conservative colleague who was a leader of uh, a council a little bit north to us, who in the height of his right-wing conservatism was telling me how regulation and legislation is bad for the economy and bad for the public and government and councils should get off people's back. I remember arguing at the time, there's nothing wrong with re regulation as long as it's the right regulation. There's nothing wrong with enforcement as long as it's just and it's fair. Reading through this report, that's exactly what this is. It's just, it's fair, and it makes sure everybody understands what's expected and sets the baseline of, you know, we will enforce certain regulations and certain enforcements where it's required in the public's interest. This is not about a draconian council. And personally, I'd like to thank Councillor Dole for this report because it really it is well-balanced and, you know, it really can be used quite well. So, yeah, I, I am a fan of regulation when it is the right regulation for the right reason. Therefore, I support this report, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Any further questions or comments from Cabinet members? Uh, I'd just like to add, uh, in terms of the enforcement policy, uh, and reading through, I echo uh, what Councillor Cook um, has raised uh, and appreciate the work that uh, your officers and yourself put into this, Councillor Doyle. Um, conversations I've had uh, with Cabinet colleagues uh, over the last few months uh, and also some figures th uh, that I've seen, I do wonder if we can be more proactive with enforcement, but it has to be measured and in the right way, as, as Councillor Cook uh, has, has suggested. Earlier on in this meeting, I referred to uh, to littering as an example. Uh, and the, the only way we're going to turn the tide, uh, and I'm not just talking littering, I'm using that as an example. The only way we're going to turn the tide is actually through through education and enforcement. Uh, so, so we need to get it right and we need to get it, it, it measured. Uh, and it's the application of as, as, as well as the policy. Uh, but no, I'd, uh, I, I, I welcome the report and the, and the policy that you brought towards us uh, this evening, Councillor Dorr. Councillor Dorr, do you want to say anything else or move the recommendations? I'd just like to say thank you for your comments. Um, delivering Standardisation is key to delivering uh, a good service, and that's what we've looked to do. Um, in terms of um, enforcement, it... You can deliver more enforcement if you have more resources. So that is the key to that one. Um, but otherwise, thank you for your comments. Okay, and you've moved that recommendation, I believe. So do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Cook has seconded. Uh, so all those in favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, moves us on to item nine on the agenda, and that is tenancy management policy. Councillor Farrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, now, a few things to address here with this report, so please bear with me. Um, start with a bit of context. So, the Council's tenancy management policy uh, introducing flexible fixed-term tenancies was first approved by this Cabinet in September 2012 and came into force the 1st of April 2013. I believe uh, half our current Cabinet were there to witness it firsthand, um, and it's now been in place for around eight and a half years. So, the policy basically brought to an end uh, secure tenancies by all intents and purposes a council house for life um, but Tamworth's current policy is to offer all new tenants five-year terms and that's reviewable at four years and six months now 
the aim of flexible fixed term tenancies was primarily for two reasons. One, to enable a review of the tenant's circumstance to make best use of the council's stock in view of their circumstance, for example, giving tenants a chance to downsize if necessary. Uh, and two, to consider affordable rent uh, changing and these aims uh, will be assessed as the consultation gets underway for this tenancy management policy. Um, now, since the indu introduction of the uh, flexible fixed term tenancies, uh, 1,229 tenants have been issued with these new flexible fixed term tenancies uh, and that includes new tenancies and renewals uh, but only eight tenants were not reissued with a new tenancy um, as the property was no longer suitable for their needs in line with the allocations policy uh, and that's less than one percent so this would suggest that the policy is not quite achieving its intended aims uh, and will be a key consideration as we consult on its future use um, so that's why this report uh, would like to trigger a consultation on the fixed term tenancies and I'm pleased to say this was also welcomed uh, just last week when the housing and homelessness subcommittee met um, and there's also another addri uh, issue addressed in this report so currently the council's flexible fixed term tenancies does not include a forfeiture clause and therefore can no longer legally terminate any of these existing tenancies um, and for the council to continue with this type of tenancy um, we'd need to vary the existing flexible fixed term tenancy agreement by inserting the relevant forfeiture clause and publishing a revised tenancy management policy setting out these changes and this has all come to our attention as a result of a recent high court case involving Croydon Council. So uh, set out in the report is a list of all available options for dealing with the current 747 fixed term tenancy issues we have at Tamapur Council uh, and this is distinct from the wider options in relation to fixed term tenancies versus secure tenancies um, as that will need to be informed by the consultation that hopefully will take place. Now doing nothing has not been considered as clearly the tenant management policy requires a detailed review in order to address the existing impact of case law and those already on a fixed term tenancy who are in arrears. Uh, it's likely to take about four months, we're looking at around April before the consultation and decisions are made on the future of the fixed term tenancies um, and the report details how existing arrangements can be contained. Uh, so Mr Chairman, uh, there's four recommendations to Cabinet. Uh, the first one is to approve the revised Flexible Fixed Term Tenancy Agreement 2021 in Appendix A, which includes the required forfeiture clause needed for all new and renewable fl uh, flexible fixed term tenancies uh, and to delegate authority to the portfolio holder for social housing and homelessness prevention to approve any final amendments to the tenancy agreement as necessary. Uh, number two, to accept the recent High Court Order of Appeal decision on flexible tenancies in the case of Croydon uh, London Borough Council versus Kalonga, that's Appendix B, uh, which has forced councils across the country to review their tenancy management policies. Number three, to endorse consultation on the basis of the tenancy management options for fixed term tenancies detailed within the report, uh, starting with the Housing and Homelessness Subcommittee and the Tenant Consultative Group. And number four, uh, for Cabinet to receive a further report on the future of fixed term tenancies in around March 2022 as part of an updated tenancy management policy. Uh, and we're lucky to have the officers here tonight as well that can answer any technical questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farrell. If I could turn to the officers, could you uh, add anything to that, but also uh, give us an indication as to, as to how the, that tenancy document that's part of the appendices has, has changed? Happy to do that, Chair. Um, very thorough update by the portfolio holder and very welcome discussion at a Housing and Harmlessness Subcommittee last week um, where we were able to... Um, share a detailed presentation on some of the technical terms which you know I'm not going to bore you with tonight but that presentation I know has been shared um, but very briefly um, a tenancy agreement is quite simply the legal contract um, between the landlord and the tenant in terms of the rights responsibilities and obligations um, the tenancy can either be a fixed term so running for a set period of time as we introduced back in 2012 2013 for two to five years um, or periodic, so running on a week-by-week -week basis or month-to-month, -month, as in um, a lifetime tenancy, it's also commonly referred to as that. So from Tamworth's perspective, we use the full range of tenancies at the moment, except introductory tenancies. So we do use Secure, so at the time the policy um, was introduced back in 2013, what we'd say was for all older persons' accommodation and one beds, they would be on a Secure lifetime tenancy. Um, because by the very nature of that accommodation, 
um, the data had said at the time that people would be moving on so we didn't need to have that kind of fixed term arrangement um, and then for every other new tenancy it's been a fixed term tenancy and as the portfolio holder has quite rightly pointed out the 747 of those currently um, and that roughly increases by around 100 to 150 a year based on our turnover of stock so again absolutely uh, right what you've heard tonight the review has been triggered by two key things um, one there's it's always been a um, accepted and good practice that we would review our tenancy management policy every five years it was last reviewed in 2014 so the plan was to review it 2019-20 anyway the pandemic hit and that inevitably paused that um, piece of work but then during that time we also had the Kalonga case which you've got the details set out uh, in the report basically that call uh, that decision um, has been taken by the High Court, successfully upheld at the Appeal Court and is waiting a Supreme Court decision. Um, but basically requires that every tenancy agreement has specific wording around the forfeiture. And on page 10 of Appendix 1, the new forfeiture wording that's been done in conjunction with our legal advisers, as was done last time, I hasten to add, uh, is set out there for you. Um, without that, uh, in terms of ten th th that forfeiture clause going forward, what it effectively does is that legal judgment um, cast precedent on every landlord across the country and the uh, sector suggests that there are 30,000 tenancies affected by this new approach, um, hence why Croydon no doubt are challenging it with the Supreme Court, um, which means that without having that there, it effectively means we couldn't seek possession, even for non-payment of rent or antisocial behaviour. So, as we said, as the report has said, and no doubt you've gone through that, it seeks to do two, two key things. One, it responds to the Klongay case and seeks to immediately stop the hemorrhage, as it were, in terms of new tenancy agreements going forward. So, that proposed tenancy agreement, with that amendment only, nothing else has been changed, um, is recommended to you so that at least for any new tenancy, um, or a tenancy that's coming up for renewal, we can at least rectify that particular issue. What the second thing the report does, however, is point to the decisions around existing fixed-term tenancies, because the legal position is quite clear. We can only vary an existing fixed-term tenancy with consent of those tenants. Now, you know, on the basis that I think the figures show in the report that there's around 53% who've got three to five years to run on that tenancy, they are unlikely to consent to something that puts them in a no better position, and that would be administratively onerous. And, and, uh, and to support that, in, uh, in view of the fact that we were going to review the tenancy management policy anyway, it seems prudent to deal with the initial housekeeping issues first, and then take the opportunity to do a full consultation on the future use of flexible fixed term tenancies and secure or lifetime tenancies. Um, what I would say is, you know, I was fortunate to be here and behind some of that policy uh, mandate and, sub and, and working with you to introduce that back in 2013. And the agreement at the time, as, the, as, as Councillor Farrell has pointed out, was about making best use of stock um, and about, you know, making sure that. We, if, if, if we could, we looked at affordable rent. Clearly, the landscape has now changed. Um, we've had a new allocations policy, which now introduces financial thresholds, which would allow us to enter into conversations with people that, if you remember from the allocations policy debate, if you're a single person household, it's 30,000. If you're a family or couple household, it's 60,000. Which, if we're gonna keep fixed term tenancies going forward, the whole issue around making best use of stock, what we charge, people's wider housing options in terms of onward aspirations. We now have all the policy frameworks that could be aligned to this to make that work. However, there's also the argument, and a lot of the sector are looking to reverse decisions around the um, fixed term tenancies. Certainly it was included in the Housing Act uh, 2016, but then abandoned by the government. Um, but certainly from that point of view, if we want to ensure balanced and sustainable communities, we have to reconcile that with what could end up being a transient um, tenant base. 
So from that point of view, looking at the benefits and what we're wanting to achieve in terms of that tenancy sustainment going forward uh, is key. When we all know that you know council housing is you know is, is is a commodity, and we know that we need to manage that in the best way possible. So uh, with your indulgent chair and cabinet, what we're asking tonight is for your approval around that forfeiture clause, which you know is fairly straightforward. Uh, but then to commence what would be a detailed consultation with our whole stakeholder group, including existing tenants, prospective tenants, all of our members, uh, our partners, etc. So we can really take the temperature of how we move forward uh, in terms of that. Um, and those options are set out there, if that's helpful, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Any comments or questions from Cabinet? Okay, um, recommenda uh, recommendation two, accept the recent High Court appeal decision on flexible tenancies in the case of Croydon London uh, Borough Council versus uh, Kalonga, which has forced councils to review their tenancy management policies. Is it for us to accept that decision or is it for us to act in response to the knowledge of that decision? because I think there's a slight difference there. So the decision of the High Court has been made. Are we forced to, to respond to that, or are we actually responding to that because it's the right thing to do and it's good, it's good practice? Because um, my, my view is that, that we respond to that uh, because we ought to, uh, and it's the right thing to do, and change our, uh, our, our tenancy management policies in light of, uh, of the information we're given rather than rather than accepting their decision, because their decision was not given to us, it was given to, to Croydon. Or are we making things too difficult? Councillor Cook. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. You know, I actually mulled over last night making that exact same point. Why is it for us to accept a court decision against Croydon Council? I, 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 did, I, I just didn't think it was um, big enough. But now, now you've said it aloud again, I'm sat here thinking, no, I actually agree with you. It's not for us to accept that. It's us to react to that. You're absolutely correct. So if, you, if you're if you moving to change it, I would absolutely follow your lead there, Mr Chairman. Councillor Farrell would like to come in. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate your semantic pedantry, um, but <laughs> I'd suggest that we actually act on it in recommendation one, and recommendation two um, just shows you what you've just done. So you can take it out if you wish, but no reason to do that. Thank you. Um, uh, to be honest, I don't think it has a material impact whether we whether we word it differently or not. It's uh, uh, we are still changing our our tenancy management policies in re in response to that. So you've proposed that, Councillor Farrell. Correct. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Bailey seconds. Sorry, Councillor Dawes, she was a bit quicker than you. Uh, all those in favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, so that brings us on to, where am I? Agenda item 10, which is the exclusion of the press and public in accordance with the provisions of the Local Authorities Executive Arrangement Meeting and Access to Information England Regulation 2012, Section 100A, bracket 4, close bracket, of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraphs 1, 2 and or 3 of part 1 of the schedule of 12A of the Act and the public interest in withholding the information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public. I so move. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Pritchard has seconded. All those in favour? That is carried. Thank you very much. If the press and public could leave and if we could end the recording, please. <laughs>